All right. Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining today's graduate initiative, Black and Latin XAO Faculty Roundtable with Columbia Faculty. My name is Melissa Mayard, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in University Life. Before we get started, I would like to take this time to do a land acknowledgement created by the Columbia University School of Nursing. We acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Lenape people on which we learn, work, and gather today at Columbia University. Lenape means real person or original person. And it is important to remember that Lenape collectively are a living and breathing community. Let us honor their legacy. Let us commit ourselves to the struggle against the forces that have dispossessed the Lenape and other indigenous people of their lands. We stand strong in our commitment to support and defend all marginalized people of this land who have been stripped of their rights to self-determination. Thank you to Columbia's nursing school who issued this acknowledgement. Whether you are seeking ways to actively promote racial justice as an ally or you identify as native or indigenous and seek resources, we invite you to visit resources for combating anti-native and indigenous racism on the University Life website. We also encourage you to find out more about the local indigenous territories and languages which you are sitting on at this moment. We're adding both resources to the chat now for you to learn more about the resources available to you at Columbia and in the broader com community. Again, thank you for joining us today. This event is part of University Life's Graduate Initiative for Inclusion and Engagement, which promotes Columbia's commitment to diversity and the success of all graduate and professional school students and is co-sponsored by the Office of the Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement. Before I turn it over to our esteemed panelist and moderator, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, this program will be recorded and shared via University Life's YouTube channel. If you have any questions about this recording, please contact our, our office. Also, please make sure to remain muted. Towards the end of the round table, there'll be an opportunity for questions. And we ask that you type your questions in the chat box so that we can answer as many as possible. We also recommend that you keep your view on speaker view versus gallery view. Now, I would like to introduce our guests. Please note that these are shortened and abbreviated bios. Each of our panelists have achieved tremendous accomplishments and I encourage you to look into them in more depth after today's event. First is Elena Cabral. As the Assistant Dean of Academic Programs and Communications, Elena directs the part-time program for MS students and oversees a portfolio of international programs and communications. A graduate of the part-time MS program, she was a staff writer at the Miami Herald. Her magazine work has appeared in Vibe, Marie Claire, Common Wheel, and Poder. She has, also worked, um, she has also worked as an editor at Scholastic News and a staff writer at the Ford Foundation's Quarterly Magazine. Elena is, a, is the faculty advisor to the National Association of Hispanic Journalists student chapter at Columbia University and is a member of the school's academic affairs team. Next is Billy Caceres. Billy is an assistant professor at the School of Nursing and the Center for Sexual and Gender Minority Health Research at Columbia University. He is currently the principal investigator of several studies to understand the influence of adverse life experiences on sleep and cardiovascular health in marginalized adults. In July 2019, Caceres began a career development uh, award from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which examines the associations of sexual identity, adverse life experiences, and cardio cardiovascular health in sexual minority women and their heterosexual sisters. Caceres is also a fellow of the American Heart Association, American Academy of Nursing, and the New York Academy of Medicine. Our next panelist is Raquel Gates. Raquel is an associate professor of film at Columbia University. Her research focuses on blackness and popular culture with special attention to discourses of taste and quality. She is the author of Double Negative, The Black Image in Popular Culture, where she argues that some of the most dis dis disreputable representations of black people in popular media can strategically pose questions about blackness, black culture and American society in ways that more respectable ones cannot. In 2020, she was named an Academy Film Scholar by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. 
committed to bringing together film studies in an academic context and film appreciation in more popular settings, Gates maintains a robust public engagement. Her work appears in both scholarly and popular publications, some of which include the New York Times, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and more. Next is Ola T. Johnson, known for her distinguished scholarship in civil procedure, legislation, and anti-discrimination law, Ola T. Johnson is equally committed to cultivating the next generation of civic-minded lawyers. In the classroom, she draws on her background in legal practice and government service to illustrate how social change can be affected through litigation as well as problem solving outside of, outside of the, court, the courtroom. Johnson's research has helped shape the national conversation on modern civil rights legislation, anti-discrimination, fair housing, congressional power, and innovations to address discrimination and inequality. Her recent work examines state and local governments efforts to enhance opportunities for historically excluded groups, as well as the conflicts that arise when states preempt local efforts to address discrimination and promote wage increases and affordable housing. In February 2020, she was appointed by the United States Department of Justice to the Resolutions Committee honoring Justice John Paul Stevens for whom she clerked. Our next panelist is Deborah Paredes. Deborah Paredes is a poet and scholar. She is the author of poetry collections, The Side of Skin and Year of the Dog and the critical study, Selene uh, Dad, Selena Latinos and the Performance of Memory, winner of the 2001, 2011 Chicana Chicano Studies Association Book Award, honorable mention and the 2010 Latin American Studies Association Latino Studies Book Award, and honorable mention. Her poetry and essays have appeared in the New York Times, Los Angeles Review of Books, Boston Review, and elsewhere. She is the co-founder of Canto Mundo, a national organization dedicated to Latinx poets and poetry. Pro Professor Paredes received her PhD from Northwestern University. Our final panelist is Brian Smith. Brian Smith is a research scientist specializing in human computer interaction and an assistant professor of computer science at Columbia University, where he directs the Computer Enabled Abilities Laboratory. His research goal is to develop computers that can grant people new abilities that help people better experience the world. His work is interdisciplinary and incorporates AI, sensing, vision, game design, augmented reality, accessibility, and social computing. He has worked in the area of blind navigation, helping people who are blind or visually impaired navigate the world using sound and vibrations. Brian is also a research scientist at SNAP Research, where he develops new concepts in human computer interaction, social computing, games, and augmented reality. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce our moderator, June Cross. June Cross is a winner of the DuPont Columbia Journalism Award, a National Emmy, and the 2021 Peabody Award. Her career has highlighted stories of the dispossessed and the intersection of race, politics, and public health. She is best known for Secret Daughter, an autobiographical documentary made in 1996, which was later developed into a memoir by the same name. She began her career as an intern at the Boston Globe and PBS's flagship station, WGBH. She went on to what is now known as PBS NewsHour and then to CBS News before obtaining a job as a staff producer at PBS Frontline, where she worked for nine years. She joined the Columbia Journalism School in 2001 and received tenure in 2006. In 2010, she founded the documentary specialization here. In the MS documentary specialization, Professor Cross and her faculty colleagues provide students with world-class world -class training in reporting and in the craft of long form visual storytelling. So I will stop talking because obviously all of these people are amazing um, and, and I'm sure you wanna hear from them. So I'm gonna kick it over to June who is going to uh, lead our session today, June. Hey, thank you so much, Melissa, for that, all of those introductions. I want to have a dinner party and invite all of you over to my house. I think that would be way cool. I just want to talk. I want to come too. I want to come too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I actually, you know, I have a sort of a raft of um, questions, not a raft, but some questions that have been prepared. And I was wondering, and then some of you have, of course, submitted questions, and I'm, and anyone else that has other questions during the course of this conversation, please just put them in the chat. 
Um, but I'm really interested, um, we all represent different schools. Uh, for how many of us did the events of last summer and the George Floyd protests begin a conversation on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our respective schools? And if so, can you talk a little bit about what's come of it or where you are in that conversation? And anybody can go first. I would be happy to go first. Thanks for the question and thanks for the introduction, um, Melissa. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that it began, I'm at the law school um, and I wouldn't say that it began a conversation, but it certainly intensified it. One of the things um, that I am really proud of in terms of our students at the law school is that they raised these questions um, years ago um, in response to um, police killings of unarmed um, black people. Um, and eight years ago, almost before there was a language for it. And there was a lot of kind of public mocking of the way in which they raised um, the ways in which these killings had traumatic effects on them. So it intensified a conversation, it really focused it. And I think it's launching us in doing work that is more transformative in thinking about pedagogy, how we produce scholarship, and also what is the purpose of law school um, and law schools. Um, I think more transformative conversations were ushered in because of 2020. June knows that at the journalism school, this too you know, became a, 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 a focus of, of attention, conversation, uh, debate, um, and you know, discussions about in particular the role of journalists and journal, journalism in, in addressing in, uh, inequities. We certainly have it in our own industry for sure. And that's been um, a longstanding conversation as well. And, and the idea that news organizations should fundamentally reflect the audiences they cover. That's just a, that's just a, a fact. Um, but then, you know, in addition to that question is, you know, how much of a of a voice can we have as reporters to you know to 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 drive this change and is that our role you know and there you know various points of, of view on that but primarily it within the context of the of the university itself it was about looking at our 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 faculty the makeup of our faculty looking at our our courses uh, looking at the people we choose to invite to come into our um, into our school to speak to our students um, and the like, um, but I found it to be an incredibly painful but uh, important experience to have to tell our own stories, you know, as people of of color who have been drawn to this campus for one way or another. I came to this campus when I was 18 years old to go to Columbia University as an undergraduate um, and had experienced a lot of things. And one of the things that I realized was that, well, I didn't realize it until, you know, I was already um, a member of the faculty, was that as someone who grew up in Texas, in San Antonio, had lived and worked in Florida and New York, that this university is one of the most welcoming places that I had ever been. Is it perfect? No. But this was the kind of place where you could grow and you could express yourself and those opinions would be counted. And I felt that for better or for worse, that people were very much open to that process happening again. It wasn't even the first time that it's happened on this campus, but um, there was a lot of listening that went on and uh, a reevaluation um, of ourselves and um, how we do things that's still ongoing today. Wouldn't be Zoom if somebody wasn't muted. Have any of the rest of you had any uh, conversations in your schools about either as a result of George Floyd or I guess Billy, I'm thinking your nursing school, right? Do I have that right? Uh, you had not just George Floyd, but also um, COVID that you're dealing with in a community that has you know, largely been hit very hard. Um, by the pandemic, um, was there time to have those kind of conversations? Yes, I mean, I think one of the great things about the School of Nursing at Columbia is that ever since our new Dean, uh, Dr. Lorraine Fraser, 
came to the school, really diversity, social justice, health equity have really been sort of the main themes of the school and sort of really centering conversations around social justice and the role of nurses, not only nurse clinicians, but also research, nurse researchers in advancing health equity. And you're absolutely right that not only were we having the conversations around police brutality sort of as a public health crisis, but also COVID and how that influenced our students, many of whom, many of whom are still working clinically while pursuing a doctorate or pursuing a master's in nursing. So we very much saw, I think, the way that it impacted our students. I think within the school, what it did was it recentered and reaffirmed the school's commitment to health equity and specifically racial justice. But I also think that from the perspective of a, of a junior faculty member, it also made it easier for us to express some of the opinions or issues that we had identified that maybe before we didn't think there was an opening to actually discuss those and be heard in a very open way, I think without being defensive. And I think what's happened is that there's been more openness around identifying potential issues even within our own school and our own profession and how we need to move forward to advance equity, but also to make it a more inclusive place for people of color. Deborah and Raquel, I see you both shaking your heads affirmatively uh, as he was talking. <laughs> um, what conversations have gone on in arts and sciences, if any? Um, so, I'll, I mean, I'll jump in. I'm, I'm in the School of the Arts, but I feel like it's a bit of a trick question for me because I was just appointed in July. So I, I couldn't tell you what's happening, um, what conversations have been happening in the school. However, well, um, so thank you, thank you very much. It's it's good to be here. Um, what I can say is, I mean, I just started at Columbia in July, but I was teaching at the College of Staten Island for the past nine years. So I, I'm not like new to being faculty, I'm, but I'm new to this this institution. Um, and so I'll, I can speak a little bit to that. I mean, what I think is interesting is. Um, you know, teaching like on Staten Island, it's a different dynamic there. Um, and I, you know, not just with George Floyd, but I mean, I, you know, Eric Garner was mur murdered on the North Shore of, of, of Staten Island. And when we talk about sort of things like um, divesting from the police, I mean, I think it's a very, it's a slightly different thing if you're in a classroom where half of your students dads or cops that there's a there's a it's a different dynamic and I, I don't and I don't mean different in, in trying to be purposely vague but it's just it's a different dynamic um I think there's a way that for me it's important to um if we're thinking about praxis um and we're thinking about sort of how to how to talk about these things in theory but also in practice what what does that mean if you have you know for my former institution students are like does that mean my dad is not going to get his retirement benefits i mean th those are the those are the actual conversations it's 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 not it's it's not just the sort of um the the the, the the where my politics are right it's it's also thinking about sort of these very real life um you know material concerns um what I do think is interesting is that in the in the I can say that in my field um, and that's you know in film and media studies, um, there's been a renewed sort of focus on how how are we taking care of students within this sort of climate, which is a thing that I think has been um, quite refreshing to see. Thinking about issues of of sort of like mental health, right? Um, I've seen a lot of um, shifts um, around pedagogy around, I mean, I had gotten rid of my attendance policy like years ago, but um, but getting rid of attendance policies, right? Like, or, or figuring out sort of more flexible attendance policies with the understanding that students are are dealing with things. I mean, I, I can say people are dealing with just the, the, the stress and the trauma um, of all of the events that are going on. But again, coming from a different institution, I mean, I had students who, couldn't sort of sign into Zoom because their parents lost their jobs because the family business tanked because of COVID related things because the restaurant went up under and now they're working three jobs to help support you know the rest of their family. So I think there's a way um, not to be a silver linings person, but I, I do think there's a way that we have um, as academics had to start really thinking about the humanity of each other uh, as colleagues and of our students as well, um, and how we build some kind of basic grace and human decency into our, our teaching um, our teaching practices and our scholarship. Thank you. Um, Deborah, Brian, I'm coming to you. 
<laughs> we have a huge panel. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. And Raquel, it's so great to have you in School of the Arts. I can't wait to see you in person at some point. Um, so I'm in a, a different division in the School of the Arts. I'm in the writing program, and then I'm also appointed in um, in arts and sciences in ethnic studies. Uh, you know, and I'll say a couple of things. I think that where I have noticed more the kind of um, reckoning in a um, post George Floyd moment is in the in the profession in the publishing world, right? In particular, um, as you know, publishing is uh, you know it has, there's sort of the statistics are kind of you know. Just perhaps shocking to some, but like overwhelmingly 99% right white for those that are in positions of power and, and editorial positions. And so there was a real kind of reckoning among the profession, which of course trickled down into, you know, the graduate schools um, around, you know, who's actually holding the, the, the sort of seats of power in regards to who gets to be published and then how then are our young writers then, you know, going to be legible, right? Um, and what does it mean to be a black writer? And what does it mean to be a brown writer? And what does it mean to be a gay writer? And how those kinds of ideas have been overdetermined, right? And make it so that if you're writing speculative young adult novel and it doesn't look the way the publishing industry might think, you know, a black novel should look, right? Like the particular challenges. So those kinds of conversations have come up. New kinds of hires have been made. But again, and I think Raquel can understand this, it, I think the conversations sometimes um, need to move beyond just simply like a singular person equals the representation that is, you know, a, a, a press needs and then the job is done, right? So I think that we're really engaged in those kinds of conversations, um, both on the kind of larger professional level and then of course in the classroom as we begin to professionalize students. And then in ethnic studies, I think that, you know, we've really, our students in ethnic studies Many of them, if not most, you know, either first generation um, students from a range of, of communities um, uh, were students who were tremendously impacted by COVID, right? These were the students, many of whom chose to go home even if they had the opportunity to be on campus because their families needed that extra few hundred dollars. Or, and then, or they were students who, when they were home, had to help get their younger siblings to the public library so they could go to Zoom school. And so we were very much reckoning throughout this last couple of years. And, and in addition to facing, I think, tremendous mental health challenges as a result of that and the ongoing violence, right, that they've been living with for so many years. So I think that that was something they've taught us a lot about how to kind of provide for them in and beyond the classroom. Um, one of the ways that that ethnic studies has responded was the students wanted to create a student advisory board. They actually then have a member of that board that actually attends our faculty executive meeting, uh, executive committee meetings as a way to really be kind of transparent, at least about the things that they can have access to um, so that we can kind of get regular feedback from them about their needs. And we can also, um, you know, be transparent about what we're doing. And um, on, yeah, and uh, in the case of the engineering school, um, I'm in the computer science department within the engineering school. Um, we, so last year we had, uh, um, we participated in what's called shutdown STEM and we spent weeks holding uh, meetings uh, open to all and a lot of folks from other universities even trickled in. Um, we had shared Google docs in which we we're uh, recounting stories and making suggestions that was open to all, um, but uh, originated within the computer science department. Um, we formed a, a committee, uh, actually two committees called the DEI committees, a steering committee and a coordination committee um, with, uh, for faculty. Um, so now we actually consider, our department considers DEI um, part of our uh, just staying in business, staying in flow. We have an academic committee, we have, a D, we have two DEI committees and the committees, we also crafted them, I think, in a really, I, I'm, I'm really happy with the way that we um, designed them. The steering committee, I chair that. And the idea is to sort of serve as the eyes of the department um, and say, like, here's what, we, wh here's what we want. We make a list of demands. We meet only once a month. It's a very light committee load. And then the coordination committee <laughs> is comprised of non-minorities. Um, uh, um, and is responsible for uh, doing the actual work um, every semester so that it's not the it's not underrepresented folks within the department that are burdened with actually doing the work as well. 
Um, and so that's pretty nice. And I'll say the engineering school, we're actually uh, at large, uh, we're actually starting to put together um, a, a website. Um, we hope to put together a website highlighting the uh, diversity of the Columbia engineering community of the past um, for the last you know, 150 years of our history. Um, and so that uh, hopefully uh, will we'll, uh, go out uh, sometime next year. I'll speak real briefly about SNAP too, um, Snapchat, uh, since I work there as a research scientist. Um, post George Floyd, um, we actually had a lot of discussions within the company as well. And um, one of the interesting things that came out of it, for me at least, I found interesting was that we realized that um, the image processing algorithms that cameras use, including within Snapchat and, and you know, anytime you take a photo, they themselves are biased against darker skin tones. And so a lot of people of color actually feel, um, uh, feel unconfident about how they look because every time they take a picture of themselves, it looks bad. And it's because the actual image processing algorithm is not, uh, does not suit uh, people with darker skin tones. And so we actually like uh, within SNAP, we made that a very high priority within the company. We called it inclusive camera um, to actually like redesign the image processing algorithm. Um, and so that uh, I, I was really happy to see that um, uh, come about, um, I think we released it in May. And we also released, um, I'm, I'm pretty proud of this. Um, uh, we released our first ever uh, um, diversity report. Uh, SNAP was one of the uh, small group of companies in tech that didn't release uh, diversity statistics. Um, and so uh, we released this um, uh, in response to me questioning Evan, the CEO, um, it snowballed into us actually releasing that. Um, so yeah, so both on the engineering school, computer science department side and on the tech industry side, I'm, I've seen uh, positive changes. Wow, that's great. Can it, how different is the, are the conversations that have been happening uh, from the conversations that you experienced when you yourselves were in graduate school? Brian, since you're in my case, we never we didn't even really have these conversations in graduate school, um, at least in my program, because um, I, I feel like the numbers are pretty stark um, in term in, in the engineering program. Um, I was for most of my PhD, I was the only black PhD student in the program. Um, and so it, it just wasn't enough uh, to have a conversation in some ways. Yeah, I know. I was an only. How many? For how many of the rest of you were you onlys uh, in your career for the early part of it? I'm just curious. You can just raise your hands. So one, two, three, four. All of us. Okay. So oh, it must be. Uh, how did we make it through? Let's talk a little bit about how we made it through. Sort of in that um, thinking along those lines. Um, what strategies did you use? Who did you rely on? Did you have a mentor? Did you call home? What, what were your go-tos? I mean, I, I can, I'll start. Um, and I went to, um, I think Deborah, you mentioned you went to Northwestern. I did my PhD at Northwestern too. Um, I mean, for me, because film and media studies tends, tends to be a pretty like overwhelmingly white field. Um, when I was in grad school, I mean, the one of the things I really loved about Northwestern is they they encouraged um, interdisciplinarity. So I was always taking courses in other departments, um, as well as, um, you know, going for a certificate in um, women and gender studies in the performance studies department, um, which uh, which was which was much blacker, uh, let's say. So um, I mean, for me, I feel like in grad school, my strategy. And I loved my department um, and, and my colleagues and my peers and my professors, but I, I knew that, that that couldn't be like my only place. Um, and so I made a point to um, you know, develop relationships um, with students and faculty, um, black students and black faculty, honestly, in other just in other depart in other related departments. Um, um, and I try to, you know, it's it's this I've I've done the same thing as as a faculty member, um, as well as tried my best, especially via conferences, to cultivate um, relationships 
with more senior, when I was a grad student and junior faculty with more senior faculty um, who are out in, in the field, um, you know, people who were friendly, um, who I was able to develop um, personal and professional relationships with that, who are who are still advising me in, in various capacities. So I, I feel like for me, the 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 sur- not just survival, but but the, the strategy has to be looking out. Your department can't give you everything. Um, and you shouldn't look for it to give you everything. And if you do, you're going to be um, you know, sorely disappointed. And and when you get into things like having issues with your third year review or tenure, you need like, you you need a team like out in the field um, who can help you in, in various ways and advise you. Um, others? Uh, I can just echo because yeah. some of the experiences are the same. You know, when I was there, performance studies was not nearly as black as it became. So I was so thrilled when that happened. Um, but, but I will say that I was trained by a black feminist and that made every single bit of difference in my career. Um, and she was the only, Professor Sandra Richards, um, who, yes, so she um, was at the time the only black full professor on Northwestern's campus. Right, so carried a particular kind of you know burden um, as a result of that, and but but for me, I think it was very important to um, that 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 was part of the the um, the guidance I had right going through um, graduate school and into my early career, um, and it mattered for so many reasons. That one because there was this encouragement to be beyond the department always, right? Um, absolutely, like Raquel said. And in particular, to be in out beyond it in ways that were very much about solidarity with other, uh, with other people of color. Like learning that on a deeply felt and also like theoretical and, and political level on all levels was really really important for me. Uh, and I think that um, so across disciplines, across race, you know, racialized categories as well was was really key. And using conferences, right, um, or other opportunities to then find other people like me, right, doing work in whether it's in, re- you know, my field or related fields, then did become, I think, important as I was developing myself, you know, as a, as a scholar or as a, as a writer um, in the years beyond graduate school. But I, I, you know, I can't emphasize enough that that was a really, it was really important for me to have had a mentor um, like Sandra, and I, and I, I just, I'm always happy to, to speak her name and, and give her thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ola T, how did you, um, how did you manage? I know I actually went across campus and found uh, the Institute for Research in African American Studies uh, for this for a long time. I was the only person, the only black professor in the J school. <laughs> At some point I was like, I need to see some other people that look like me. So I'm, I'm just curious whether strategies folks came up. I, I think crossing disciplines is really important. I'm just wondering, Alati and Billy. Yeah, um, well, um, thanks for asking. I was re- reflecting on the question because I was thinking that in many ways I feel really privileged. And when I was, from the time I started the law school, there were always other Black people there. In fact, the the scholarship, the scholarship that I got to start at Columbia Law School was the Kellis Parker um, Fellowship. Um, and he was the first African American professor at Columbia Law School. And I always think about the challenges that faced people like Kellis and even the next generation, like Pat Williams, Kendall Thomas, and Kim Crenshaw. Um, but they paved the way for people like me. Um, But I think in general, I mean, you know, the numbers haven't increased um, to the extent that they should. And so, you know, what that meant for me practically is that oftentimes it's, you're the one sitting on committees or, um, and are the only black person on those committees. Um, There's not actually enough of you to spread around the governance of the school. And that's a reoccurring challenge, I think, um, that graduate students and new professors face with regard to some of the service um, commitments. Um, And also, you know, isolating in terms of um, workshops and academic workshops. Um, So some of my fields, because my law is interdisciplinary, which by the way, is an invitation to all of you um, who are graduate students, 
to engage in different aspects of the law, whatever your discipline is, it's not, uh, you know, law itself is interdisciplinary. So you'd be coming from the arts or from the economics or political science um, and all of those things um, can interface with the law. But I might go into some spaces like the civil rights space and see a lot of people of color and, and women certainly, and then other spaces, not true. Even if you're dealing with something that has squarely to do with race or economic inequality, sometimes I was the only black person in the room, unbelievably. So it really, um, there are big divisions in terms of um, fields within law, um, methodologies um, where it comes up. And, and I guess, you know, what I would say for me, and this relates to something we were talking about that we might bring up later on is just things that we're proud of. Um, I'm actually proud that in a lot of the spaces that I'm now in, I'm no longer close to being the only one. And that some of the people who are in those spaces are people who have participated in either teaching or mentoring. I've just seen a big increase in the number of people of color who are entering the legal academy. And I think some of that is because of individual mentoring activity, but I think more importantly, setting up institutional pathways for um, people to become legal academics. That's great. Um, Ilya or Elena, do you want to address this question or should I keep moving? Um, I mean, I think the one thing I will say is that it wasn't until my PhD program, and I had completed three degrees before then, where I had a mentor who was a, a fellow Latinx person. And I and I never really thought about it, but it wasn't until I sort of started interacting with them that I realized that there were certain things that I didn't need to explain about how I thought about situations or how I approached situations when I was dealing with another person who had also dealt with being a minoritizer or another person within academia and nursing academia in particular. And I think that, so I often maybe from the generation that I was like, we weren't talking about the issues and I'm the generation that I was, but I'm not that, I'm not even that old, but I'm just saying like, even 10 years ago, we weren't having these conversations. Like, I think that you just sort of looked around, realized that you were an other and you sort of made it work and you figured out a way to navigate those systems. And I never once occurred to me that maybe having mentors that looked like me or understood my experiences might be helpful to me. So I think I was rather naive in some ways because I didn't even seek out those opportunities. I sort of relied more on my peers even outside of academia, just friends that I had made and sort of like to help support me through experiences. But I think we all recognize that each of our fields and even departments have their own culture. So I, many times I didn't really have people to sort of help me navigate through those situations. And I, I, I don't know how things might have turned out differently, but I think that that's one of the things that I think about now, just how different things might have been potentially had I had mentors that sort of understood my background a little bit better. It's like being gaslit your entire career without knowing you're being gaslit. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, Elena, go ahead. Oh, me, okay. Well, you know, I, I feel very fortunate that I have the upbringing that I, I've had. You know, I grew up in the home of two activists. My father led marches against the Klan when they were given a permit to march in my hometown and against discriminatory immigration policies and US involvement in Central American countries like Salvador. You know, and this is like 70s, 80s, you know, and I carried banners at the age of nine at these very rallies and saw the white robes of the Klan myself and grew up watching him behind a microphone demanding justice, dignity, and change, you know, and he also had one of the first bilingual community newspapers in the country and he fought in an important free press case in the early 1980s. It wasn't until I saw like other people like sort of talk about their um, mostly white, you know, uh, newspaper pedigrees, you know, that I realized, you know, I have one too. <laughs> I didn't realize that, you know, I mean, I sort of took it for granted when I, I, I you know, it was something that I'd never, to, I'd never told until, uh, you know, coming from, but he was also hard and demanding, made us change the oil in our cars before we even had a license to drive them. And he wanted us to be able to, you know, um, to do things on our own. He made sure that we were bilingual, that we dance ballet folklorico as a way of learning about our Mexican heritage, you know, and, and th those are things that I took for granted. And, it and you know, when, 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 when I got to Colombia, I felt very well equipped for that. For, 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 for 
you know, knowing who I am, knowing who I am, that's so important, you know, because when you get into an environment where no one looks like you and no one sort of understands, you know, a lot of the culture that you bring with you, um, you meet people who make snap decisions about you before they before you even open your mouth right and 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 that and that's difficult but it's very interesting to me that you know among all of our stories it's just this one person this one mentor that makes a difference against the 10 or 12 or or 50 who don't get it you know and, and well that was sam friedman uh in my in my reporting class professor sam friedman who teaches a really wonderful book writing class um, and makes sure every time he teaches that class that he has a, an incredibly diverse array of authors, people in the publishing industry. But more than that, that he selects stories that might not otherwise be told. I worked in publishing um, at Scholastic and know that there was a great hunger um, in the publishing industry for stories of, of, of people of color. Oh, and then, you know, for young people. And I just want to stop and uh, thank Brian for a second for as the mother of a teenage girl, you know, who, you know, doesn't see herself in a lot of places and sometimes feels bad about that, you know, thank you for make for helping to find a solution to that in, in, in social media. You know, when I went through that as a child, again, it was my father, you know, when I didn't look like a lot of the girls in my high school, you know, and felt that I wasn't very attractive or, or, or pretty, you know, and he said to me, well, why do you think all these white girls are going out in the sun and burning their skin because they want to look like you and they want to have your big full lips and why do you think it's always you know these latinas from puerto rico and mexico and venezuela who win all these beauty contests because that's because they're beautiful and so are you so be quiet <laughs> and um that reminded me of the time that i met professor friedman and i had this bad habit of there's a video of this story somewhere in the university archives about doubting myself so much that when someone gave me a compliment about my writing in particular, I would have this very bad habit. I think a lot of women do this too. We're just like, no, 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 you know, it's, a, you know, it's not really that good. It's, you know, um, and that, that finally one day he called me over away from the crowd of students that were gathered outside a courthouse for a tour and said, why do you do that? Don't you know that you are a fantastic storyteller, good writer, you know? you're terrific and you're going to go places. So own that, own it, mm. you know, and that was just the turning point for me at the university because no one had ever called me on that. No one until that moment. And I remember thinking, I am good. You know, I, I do know what I'm doing and I, and I can make it in this industry because Sam says that I can. And it is amazing how you such one person in authority with the credential and, a, and tenure <laughs> who tells you the truth about yourself, the real truth about yourself, and even gives it to you, you know, with a little bit of admonition, you know, um, to shape up and do better and, and, and believe in yourself is something that I try to remember every day when I talk to students, you know. And, and I want to tell them, defiendete, you know, like stand up for yourself. Don't let someone make you doubt what you're doing or, or, or who you are, the questions that you ask or the stories that you tell. They matter and you matter, you know. Um, so I feel very privileged to be making the change from a, high, from a higher platform than maybe my parents started out with um, and being able to be a voice from within the university in these conversations where maybe I am the only Latina in the room, but I'll own it and say, I'm speaking for my sisters and brothers and telling you, you need to think about this, you know? And, and that's, that's a great, that's a great honor. Thank you. Um, Brian, in computer science, I mean, computer science always felt like Greek to me. Um, <laughs> I work in journalism, I'm a wordsman, uh, but I'm wondering, you know, um, were these, who was it, who made the difference for you? For me, it was my um, PhD mentor, or my PhD, my PhD advisor, who's now uh, my faculty mentor, uh, Professor Sri Nair in the computer science department. Um, he believed in me before I believed in myself. Um, and I will say that like a lot of what Elena just said uh, really resonated with me. Um, I think that like 
looking back, um, being the only black PhD student, the only black person in an organization is really tough, but it's really the self doubt that comes as a result from that. That's your biggest enemy in some ways. Um, and having a person uh, just kind of believe in me unconditionally um, in some ways um, helped me get past that. Um, it, so I would, so um, I also made a lot of friends, I think, you know, so, so, so Shri helped, but I also made other friends who were, you know, are people who you wouldn't think of as being a PhD student mentor or advisor. Um, you know, someone who worked in the IT department, someone who uh, worked in undergraduate advising, et cetera, et cetera. I kept in touch with these people because they gave me that belief in myself that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, being the word, like uh, I learned this later in life um, as a faculty member at a workshop actually, that the word mentorship is actually overloaded. Um, and that there are many different uh, things that uh, are important to get out of a mentor. Uh, and so that PhD student experience, reaching out to other people for that purpose, um, and what I'm doing currently uh, is helping there. So for example, having a person just believe in you unconditionally, you're amazing, everyone wants, you know, you're doing this, keep going. That's like one form of mentorship having someone uh, help you make connections at conferences and such. That's another role of a mentor. There are many, uh, there are several others. I can paste a link to a relevant um, uh, thing. And so lately I've actually been um, uh, following this, what's called the Thrive Mosaic, six different mentor roles and slotting people into those roles so that whenever I'm having self doubt, I can see what it's about and I know who I should talk to about that thing rather than trying to find one all encompassing mentor. Can you talk a little bit more about what is the Thrive Mosaic? I've not heard this term. Yeah, so it was developed by um, Professor Robin Chapman, um, who's now a, um, who's at Harvard Business School now, or sorry, uh, uh, Kennedy, I think, um, School of Government at Harvard. And it's, um, uh, it describes six roles that mentors have. Um, so advocate is the person who believes you, um, you know, et cetera. A coach is someone who is uh, excellent, who excels at the craft and who's helping you get better at that craft. A connector is someone to just introduce you to other people. You can't break in because you haven't met that other person yet. So who can you use as a connector mentor? Um, there's, there are also others such as uh, um, uh, like targeted training, et cetera. But what it is, is just a framework for keeping track of your mentors over time so that at any situation, if you have a particular problem, you know who to ask. And, and it's also recommended that you even tell your mentors, hey, this is how I'm organizing my, my mentor circle. Um, and so, you know, this is uh, the type of advice I'd like to get from you. Very helpful, thank you. Um, have any of us used campus um, resources uh, during our academic career outside of outside of our departments? And how beneficial was it if you did? No one did, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are a lot of professional organizations that I'm sure we all know about, like the you know National Association of Hispanic Black Journalists. Those become professional families outside of the academic arena for a lot of us, right? They do. They do. Yeah, they do. Um, I have a question here that I didn't ask that Olati referred to. What have been the points of pride and accomplishments uh, in your careers? And some of this has been answered, I think, but um, Deborah, Raquel, Billy, wondering. Sure. Uh, I can, I can respond. Um, I think that one of the um, points of pride that was also though very difficult to do um, was, was the founding of Canto Mundo for, um, for me. And I think it was in part, one, something I did not do alone, right? It taught me so much about how to work collaboratively. It was co-founded, an organization that we, that was co-founded. You know, we, I, I responded to a call to meet folks around a kitchen table, literally, to talk about like, 
what would it be like, you know, we were preceded by amazing organizations, Kaveh Kanem and Kundiman, that were respectively organizations for black and Asian American writers. And we said, what would happen if we had a Latino Kaveh Kanem? You know, what would, would be required? And I think that learning how to collectively dream and struggle with folks across generations invested in saying, we don't have this community around us and it is upon us to then make it, right? Was an, an incredibly important lesson for me and then became something that I was really proud of um, over the course of the 10 years that I ran it. Um, and it was also a really good lesson in knowing also that like how to take, how to learn how to constantly remind yourself to take the ego out of the work of leadership too, because it was also important for us to let it go, like to then give it over to new leaders and be willing to sort of say whatever happens, happens, it's, you know, for this institution. And I think learning about how to both be in those roles of leadership, how to how to disinvest from the disinvest from the ego or the particular power or status that one might um, often try to seek there, I think is was was really, really important for me and one that I continue to try to learn from. Okay. Um, that's a, uh, I don't know, like, I, this, well, I don't know what I've been most proud of. I'll, I'll say something that I, I felt pretty proud of. I mean, I, when I got the, um, so I, I received, um, in a, uh, a, a film, an Academy film, um, grant. So like from the, like the Oscars folks, like, um, you can apply, um, to be a, like a film scholar. Um, and the reason that I was really proud of that isn't because like, it's a, it's an honor and, and, and money like towards <laughs> torture research, which is really important. Um, we talk a lot about mentorship and like, you know, like our individual mentality, but like resources, like that's the, that's the thing too. Right. And so, um, it was exciting for that, but the reason it meant so much to me is because, um, as a scholar who does black pop culture, like I, I'm not doing French cinema. I mean, I can't like, I, I'm, I'm doing reality television. I'm doing like coming to America. Like that's my research, you know? Um, and to be in, in a field and in, you know, sort of like in academia where people like that stuff, but don't necessarily take it seriously. And 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 so I felt like since grad school, um, you know, it's often been an uphill battle to say like, yeah, I'm writing this thing that's going to be about the aesthetics of reality television. And like, you know, I, I mean, to have that type of project get sort of like recognized as being like a serious project. I mean, that that for me, it just, it felt like validation that I was doing something right since that had not, um, you know, that hadn't been a given for a good portion of my career, career quite frankly. So um, that was something I was super proud of. Well, congratulations. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, anyone else want to speak to points of pride and accomplishments in your career, just so you can be known to the those who are watching? Um, so I can talk about this because one of these happened last week and I didn't realize how happy it would make me until it actually happened. But, um, you know, there are things that we all do as academics that we apply for grants or apply for an award or whatever those things are. And points of like awards or grants are things that I've achieved myself. Like I am bad at this. I don't celebrate those things. I should celebrate them more. But when people that I've mentored, particularly Black and Latinx students, I see them succeed, however small that might be. And last week, a rather big thing happened. I am just so overjoyed and happy for them that I don't know if I've experienced a feeling like that. Like if I could bottle that feeling of feeling proud of a mentee and just keep it with me every day, I feel like I would just be going around singing and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be the typical New Yorker that just walks around with my headphones in and doesn't say hi to people. But I think that those times where I've seen people that I've mentored do well are really the things that I'm most proud of. And it's one of the things that I think why I chose to be, go into academia and do the work that we do, that I do at least. Okay. Now, the last time I moderated this panel, which I think was, I don't know what, three years ago, we, were t we spent out some time talking about how things could be improved for Black and Latinx faculty, um, and particularly the service load that we carry as only or one of a few. Um, versus the pressure to keep doing the work that got us here in the first place. 
And I'm wondering, you know, is that still an issue among you? Is there, are there, are there other areas where you see room for imp improvement that the university needs to be working on? I'm sure there are <laughs> then people are thinking like, okay, now what can I really say on this thing? It's being recorded. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm happy to speak to some of them and maybe it's also to offer a bit of a commendation. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, when you think about what we need to be able to get tenure, I mean, that's really, you know, what the goal is for many of us within our disciplines. Um, we really need um, time and support to be able to do our research. Um, so one thing that I think is really important that some people alluded to, you um, June, you asked about um, supports on campus. I mean, one of the things that I've also found really Im important is to be able to have that support within a network that's broader than campus. And a few people mentioned that, right? So you do need mentors in all sorts of places. And I think it's it's really striking in people's stories. They didn't just talk about mentors of color, obviously, but you need people to be able to read your writing um, and give you um, honest and helpful feedback. And so sometimes that happens in spaces that are created um, outside of the usual conferences. And so having institutions willing to support travel and gathering and um, writing sessions and retreats where you really get feedback. Um, and I think adjacent to that is giving opportunities for young people and younger scholars uh, or early scholars to, prevent, to present their work in an environment where they can get um, feedback. Not all departments are set up in a way to be able to give that kind of effective feedback. You're either supposed to present such an advanced project, you know, where people might be overly scrutinizing you. You need a space to be able to prevent, present early work. On the service thing, um, I think that the university has really come a long way just in sending out the message to all schools or that encourage ways of crediting service and recognizing that women and um, professors and scholars of color really have a disproportionate service load. And it extends to teaching um, too, you know, the ways in which we mentor um, informally through, through teaching, not just sit on governance committees. And just a part of that that has been really helpful in our school is that we have to report annually at all the activities that we do. And our dean really asks for every kind of mentoring contact and makes that visible. And, um, and tries at least to um, give you, it's not just recognition, but sort of balance out that mentoring load um, so that you don't have to do other sorts of service if you don't want to. Um, um, and then I guess the last thing that I would mention that I think the university has made strides on, but it's, there's probably always more to do. Um, I have kids now who are 17 and 14 and you know, they're out and about by themselves uh, and out getting, you know, to their various activities. But for me, the far and away, the biggest barrier I faced had to do with just the expense and the time, you know, related to um, child care and, and caregiving. Um, and, you know, for some people, it could be a, an older relative or, you know, a, you know, a parent. Um, and I think the university, again, has made a lot of progress in supporting that um, institutionally, but I think it's always something that one has to look at. I, I promised myself when I was, um, that I would mention it anytime anyone asked me to talk about gender or race or the challenges of being um, an, a, you know, a, a young pre-tenured person that everything that anyone asked me to do, it was just a trade-off in, in time. It's like a meeting at four o'clock, a panel at 5.30. You know, all of those things um, are really hard to do when you have um, younger children. So I think being attentive to that in the design of programming or um, in giving support for childcare resources, giving extra time um, if people want it. I know there are mixed views on that on the tenure clock. You know, those kinds of things I think are very important institutional steps. Um, do we have other moms here? How are you balancing all this out? Oh, all of you. Uh, yeah. Nicole, Deborah, Elena, Brian, are you a dad? I am not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have it easy. <laughs> uh, moms on the panel, how do you balance it all out? You don't. Mm -hmm. Like you just, I, sorry, you, I got all excited when you brought up childcare and, and, and mother, like, 
yeah, I, the academia is not set up for us. It's just, it's just not. Um, and I think that um, certain resources, um, like the fact that, like, as faculty at Columbia, like, there's money for me to hire a sitter if one of my kids is sick at like what like I, I, that's that's an amazing uh resource because I, what we see time and time again i think particularly with um um with and it is gendered right i mean i can't just say parents because it's 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 gendered i mean it it took you can say whatever you want about parental leave but i mean it I, it took me two or two years to come back like in terms of any kind of research productivity, <laughs> I mean, after I have twin boys, um, and they'll be six in December. Um, but so they're little, like we're we're in the trenches. Um, but I, the, you know, I think it's important when we think about institutions and resources that the the whatever resources are provided are to essentially fill a gap to cover over the fact that these institutions were not set up for people like us. They were not set up for people from working class backgrounds. They were not set up who, who can like, who can afford to put something on your credit card and wait for reimbursement. That, that's a privilege. That's not a thing that everybody has. I mean, they were not set up for like minorities. They were not set up for mothers. Um, you're supposed to like, the husband's supposed to be the professor and his wife's supposed to be at home taking care of his kids, right? And so I think it's important to think about those resources not as like, um, as, as things that are really trying to like fill gaps, um, which I think is an important uh, perspective shift. But I also wanted to just kind of add in terms of thinking about things the university can be doing. I, I mean, I would love to see more professionalization workshops and courses for grad students and for junior faculty um, because we focus so much on, on things like research, but we don't talk about like, how do you engage on Twitter or how do you not engage on Twitter? Like, like these types of things, what, how, how do you ask a decent question at a conference? How do you not ask, like what questions do you not ask at conference? I mean, I think there, there's a lot of that stuff um, that, that are like soft skills um, that mm -hmm. some people get, particularly if they have like sort of a strong um, network of mentors. But if you're the first person in your family to go to college, first person in your family to, to go to grad school, th these things are not, are not necessarily obvious. Obvious, right. Um, and so I would love to see a sort of a structured official um, sort of program around that type of thing. You know, one of the things that I think are uh, really important that, that, we, that we've learned in a, in a time of, in journalism of, of um, transformation is the, the power of collaboration, you know, and, and having news organizations pool their resources in order to create fellowships for, for students, and in particular, students of color. But we as a university also have the ability to do that. And, you know, uh, the journalism school now has an array of postgraduate fellowships for students to continue their education here. So that is to say they don't have to go back home and figure it out on their own about how to enter this network of, um, uh, of uh, you know, news organizations on their own. They can, what I always like to say when I'm, when I'm um, advocating for students to apply to these postgraduate fellowships is that this is a way for you to continue your Columbia experience, except instead of paying us, we pay you, you know, which is a great thing. And co collaboration with news organizations, with the leaders in our industry is such a terrific idea to do, bring in, you know, working journalists to to continue the development of our students in the field um, on issues that they care a lot about, like, you um, you know, uh, cross-border migration, which is something we do, or the impact of climate change on communities of color, in particular around uh, the country, people who are exposed to, um, you know, hurricanes and wildfires and the like, um, but get but get really hard, get hit really hard, and they're able to do this research in a safe way, the way that they were in their classroom. So um, they have a great deal of mentorship, possibly more than they would get in an average newsroom um, on their own, and can come away with something to show for it, like a, a clip in the New York Times about how home health care aides, for example, as one of our MA students co-authored uh, recently in the, um, and published in the New York Times, how badly home health care aides are treated, uh, paid long hours, exposure to COVID and telling their stories, you know, in a long form narrative piece, you know, because they had the support of Columbia 
to help them do that story, you know, um, without starving and without, you know, um, knowing and knowing someone in the industry uh, on the local level where there aren't that many jobs and there certainly aren't any fellowships. So collaboration with uh, the institutions of, um, of the industries that we prepare our students for is something I think we could do more of. Um, there's, a there's a conversation in the chat going on about resources that are available for uh, students um, who have um, mixed status immigrants, um, immigrant families with mixed status. Do I have that right? Hold on, Deborah, Tatanga. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, has that issue come up for anyone else here on the panel? And if so, have you used resources at the university? What else should we be thinking about exploiting? What other what other support could we be offering? At the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race, we do, this is something we regularly discuss and try to strategize about. We've definitely um, had our students work closely with Ishel um, as well, um, given the the large number of students in, in our, uh, among our majors and concentrators who have often have mixed status families. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it, this is partly an answer to the previous question and also for this, you know, one thing that we have been arguing for and that quite honestly we have faced challenges in doing is, you know, we're Columbia in New York City in Morningside Heights and there are not enough Latinx studies professors on this campus. There are very few. And I'm curious, I was thinking about that earlier. That, pardon me? How many are, do, how many are there? No? It's hard to count because the university <laughs> likes to count those, those faculty members who are, let's say, from Latin America or even Spain, right, as part of Latin, and, and that's very different from saying we are invested in having um, faculty here who um, sort of are experts in the field of Latinx studies, right, who then are also themselves often quite familiar either through their research or their lived experience with issues like migration and, and those kinds of things. And so what has happened is because there's so few, when when hires are put forward, right, for consideration for tenure or for hires at all, there isn't enough legibility in terms of uh, legibility um, in terms of the discipline right, among the faculty who are here, and then it becomes, it sort of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of, of not being able to make those hires. So I, I mean, if someone were to ask me what should happen, I think that some, you know, senior hires in those areas should happen. But I think also, because what that can mean is we have more faculty resources for students to be able to even come to a, a faculty member with these issues and, and fear and not have a certain kind of fear around the responses they might get. I, I do feel some of those as the director of undergraduate studies in ethnic studies. So students will come to me around issues of food insecurity or documentation status. And I think that those kinds of things are ones that I feel like we're constantly trying to figure out how to provide resources for. Um, both officially through the, the great work that Ishelle does, but also sometimes even unofficially. So for example, the Center for Ethnic Studies started at least prior to COVID and we're still trying to figure out how to reinstitute this. Um, Friday morning breakfasts mm -hmm. for the students, breakfasts that are just offered, right? People can come and go and it's just a free meal for students to, to find, you know, to just, um, and have a place to land, to meet each other and to also get food. So. These are just some of the ways in which we've, I think, tried to um, engage in that. Um, I wondered if there are any, do I have any, do we have any questions, Melissa? I see you popped on here and I'm trying to scroll because I've been listening to you instead of reading <laughs> the chat. Oh, fine, I just uh, dropped one question here from um, the student who raised their hand earlier. Right. Uh, who was that? Um, was Vivian. So Vivian, you're welcome to unmute if you like. Um, but Vivian asked, there are so many intersectional identities among those of us working in this academic space. And the separation is often caused by the power titles carry, um, the power titles carried, example, faculty versus research scholar, traditional pathway versus non-traditional pathway to university life, et cetera. What are we doing to cross intra-BIPOC borders, particularly black women? Okay. And Vivian, yeah, I don't know if you have That's any another whole 
<laughs> hour of conversation, but that is an, a really, I'm aware of it here at the J school. Um, and actually even just listening to you talk, Elena, I keep thinking, I need to go down there and talk to you more often. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's hard just because there are only 24 hours in a day, but um, is anyone aware of work that's being done um, to bring uh, across those lines of um, tenured versus non-tenured research scholar, administrative assistant? Uh, And I included the question in the chat as well. Yeah. So Vivian, do you want to speak to this at all? I see you. Pop sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I, yeah, I couldn't have more intersections if I tried. So, um, I became a community scholar in 2017. At that time, I was 57. That inspired me to apply to graduate school. So, I went to the School of the Arts, graduated in 2020. And now I work in the Department of Sociology um, as a um, associate research scholar. Now, all of that happened 20 years after I was released from prison and ran a nonprofit helping other women graduate with their bachelor's degrees from mostly City University of New York. So th there are so many non-traditional elements to my story that finding um, community is really hard. And so I saw this invitation in my inbox and I just said, well, um, nothing beats a failure but a try. So um, let me pop in and see what's going on. And I, I mean, what this is doing is just, it's really verifying my suspicion that it's hard to build community across so many different barriers. But I thank you for, for um, putting my question to the floor. Sure. Um, you know, I don't have a graduate degree <laughs> at all of any kind. <laughs> um, and somehow or another, I got tenure here. I, you know, it's like I, you know, thank you, whoever, whatever in the universe got me here. Um, and I think it's one of the hardest things when you feel like an outsider to become part of a, of a community that may be welcoming you. And this was part of what I was trying to get at earlier when we were, you know, when all of you were um, graduate students yourselves, how did you find your way through. Um, and I think for some of us, it was mentorship. Um, others found their peers. Um, do you have any other strategies for Vivian um, based on what she was talking about, Raquel? Go ahead. I mean, I, I would, I, I also really appreciate that, that question and that, that yeah. comment, because I also think, um, I think one of the things that can potentially drop out sometimes when we when we're talking about identities as being like the only in a program, which is like a significant part is like what drops out is the immense privilege of whatever position we have, especially relationally to, to other to other folks. Right. I mean, I think I think there's a way that being really self-aware and really self-honest. Uh, self-honest, that's not a phrase, but being really self-aware, and really honest about that is is a first step of something. So, I mean, this isn't a structural thing, but I mean, I remember there was my, my institution was in such a bad budget crisis that one year, I mean, I was in a, I was an associate professor. My travel budget was $93 for the year, like at a comp, I mean, like that's what it was. Right. And I remember a faculty, a colleague at another school, like paying for my cab ride, right. Or somebody, or I have, a, I have another friend, um, who's a professor at Northwestern, who every time she goes to a conference, she always gets uh, a room with two beds um, because she always offers a bed. She always offers a place to stay to a faculty member who is like contingent faculty or, or someone who doesn't have a travel budget so that they can attend a conference. And I mean, those aren't structural things, but I think about those as being like, where can you use the privilege that you have to like foster community or solidarity or to like allow like, how can you sort of like reallocate your own resources? Um, and those are like kind of small examples, but I think 
keeping in mind that not everybody has a travel budget, not everybody has access to certain networks because they, they literally can't afford to go to the conference. What can you do with that? How, how can you address that? I was really fortunate that I had friends in the field who one time like pooled some money so I could go to ASA, it's American Studies Conference, because I, I didn't have the money to go. Um, that's hard because those are like, those are friendships. But I think that at the very least, those of us who have any kind of sort of a ability to advocate or to give resources should be thinking about that um, as, as, as like an automatic component of how we're doing our jobs. I also wanted to say that I love the question, um, Vivian, and the invitation for us to really think differently. I, I feel like when I've seen us cross our normal kind, kinds of boundaries, it's been in two ways. Um, one is around questions of just identity, like trying to just find a way for Black women to kind of gather um, across the campus, um, however people define themselves. Um, and sometimes that works, but it's not always sustainable. Um, and the, but the second opening is sometimes around a project, like a common project. Like for example, a lot of people on campus work on issues involving reentry, and they work from different disciplines and different domains and try to include different, uh, you know, people who produce knowledge in different ways and, and people who've been most impacted. Maybe it's not perfect, but I think it's around a, a common project. Um, but I think you're inviting us to think about this more comprehensively and what it means, you know, what are the openings of doing that, whatever our work is. Um, and it's something that, you know, I, I know myself that I will re really reflect on a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. What advice do you have for current students? Yeah, so I um, a couple things. Like one, I, or, uh, the main thing is um, I feel that a lot of hesitation or um, self doubt um, that people have it, it's it's kind of a negative feedback loop. Um, mm -hmm. Being right, being a member of a minority um, can make you feel excluded or make you feel like uh, you have so much further to go than other people to get to the same place. Um, and then that could, that feeling itself can make you underperform, um, right? And so advice number one um, is to relax your standard uh, for what you should be proud of, um, I, right? We all live, we all wanna live a life that we can be proud of. Um, and it can be easy to think that you're behind on things and it just takes so much more work to get to a place where you can be proud of. Um, Elena earlier mentioned, you know, the importance of like, you know, owning it. Um, and, and so I would say to realize that you are um, by almost by definition, uh, living an extraordinary life um, and not a compromised one. And the fact that you are the only person and you get to make these choices and you're in this situation um, that uh, so many others aren't in, uh, is itself extraordinary. Um, so in some ways, like relax your standards um, and be proud of where you are already. Um, and that can uh, give you the energy to keep going. And then the second thing, I guess, for students is to go take advantage of professors' office hours. Um, I feel like so often um, uh, students might come only, you know, a, a small, like a minority of students might come uh, and just about homework questions or what's going to be on the midterm or, you know, did I you know, submit this assignment correctly? Um, actually, you should feel free to like, you know, to come and, and have conversations with professors. Um, I, um, I, I enjoy getting to know my students. And I think most faculty here uh, would say that one of the reasons why they're a professor and not working out in the field, at least in engineering, uh, is, uh, is um, that uh, they, they love the potential to mentor and cultivate new talent. Um, and so take advantage of that. Um, I think that you might be able to form some bonds and, and add mentors um, in places that you don't uh, expect. And, and I can say that being on the other side, I was a student here at Columbia. Now I'm a professor here. Um, and so many of my old pro my professors uh, are now colleagues. Uh, and I, a surprising number of them are um, amazingly generous people. Mm -hmm. um, that I wouldn't have guessed from the side as a student. Um, That's true. Uh, Raquel? 
I'm going to, I'm so sorry to, to, to like raise my hand to jump in, but I have to go to pick up my kids. So can I give some advice? And then yes. I'm just like, I don't want to like drop no, the mic and run okay. off, but like, I got to go pick up my kids. When I can see here, go ahead. No, I, so I just wanted my advice to, to, to students would be, um, to know what your work is. Um, and I think because I feel very blessed that when I was a grad student, like Twitter was not a thing. Um, and there's, I think there's so much, especially for um, grad students and junior faculty, there's so much of an emphasis now, people wanna be very public facing. Um, and what happens sometimes is the work drops out. And, and when you go, like to get a job, no one will care that your that your post went viral or that you know what I'm saying or that like you had whatever like they care about the work and I I think that um, also don't be a I mean I think be open to um, to hard to to sometimes hard truths um, and to listening to folks I mean there's an interesting point I think you hit when you're like in your fourth year of grad school where you kind of think you have everything um, figured out, which most of us now can sort of laugh at because um, we're on the other side of it. Um, but I think that having good people that you trust um, whose advice you're, you're open and willing to taking um, is it was the thing that um, was the most beneficial for me, quite frankly. So thank you so much for having me here. And it's, oh, and it's nice to chat with everyone. Nice to know you. Yeah, and oh. I'll see everybody around, sorry. <laughs> bye bye. bye. <laughs> um, Billy, Alati, Deborah, Elena, advance for. Um, I guess piggybacking on what Brian said, I would say, you know, uh, that there are so many um, untapped resources at this school. Like when you asked us about how many of us have taken advantage, that's pretty typical that, you know, we're just drowning in our own work and trying to keep our heads above water and prove, prove ourselves sometimes on the most basic level uh, that we don't look around and look at the um, career services office, you know, wall. And sometimes it's because we don't think that these, you know, incredibly prestigious fellowships and internships are for us somehow. We internalize that because of the way that we've grown up and who we see in those institutions. But my advice to students uh, that I mentor now is apply because, you know, not that cuesta nada, it doesn't cost you anything. Like who, you know, uh, you should throw your hat in. I mean, even if you don't feel you have the, you know, a snowball's chance in hell of, get, of getting it. Because my experience with students is that they get an interview and it is a game changer. You know, they're suddenly getting to tell their story and realizing how valuable they are, especially if they have a second language, you know, in an industry that desperately needs them. Um, and it's not just because of who they are, but what they can do because they are at Columbia, because they have now or will be earning this degree, which is gonna open so many doors for them. And they can't necessarily see past midterms, um, much less after graduation but they will have that credential. And so they have to sort of think now about what kinds of opportunities they're gonna apply for. So, you know, firstly, make sure that you have someone, anyone to look at those documents, to read, everyone needs an editor, everyone, you know, and um, gr the Grammarly doesn't cut it. Sometimes you, you know, need, you know, someone to really tell you, um, how to rework the, the first sentence of your cover letters, you know, so that they make an impact because the, 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 in our, you know, industry, there are thousands and thousands of these applications floating around. So you do have to do, you know, you do have to invest at least an hour two or two in your week to think about your future in terms of your job prospects uh, on top of that coursework. And, um, but it means going to the office, you know, it, um, ignoring the stairs and not interpreting anything in them and looking at the applications and write, taking the time to write the letter, show it to someone, get that resume polished and send it in, send it in because, um, you know, you, all of us have had the experience of having a classmate or someone that we sort of like, no, we can do, you know, <laughs> better work than, and we were just sort of puzzled and befuddled and angry about the fact that we didn't apply or that that's the other person got the chance and we didn't, you know? No one wants to feel that kind of regret. You know, this is your chance. This is your time to really show who you are and what you, what you can do. And, um, 
you know, sometimes no one's going to tell you to write that application. No one's going to look for you and seek you out. So you have to be your own advocate. Yeah, I think those are wise words. Um, Billy or Deborah OT, do you have anything to add to that? Or if not, I, I just love all that advice and I'm, I'm nodding I my head. I wish, I wish <laughs> I had somebody giving me that advice when I was, uh, when I was at a younger persons. I've spent so many years trying to deal with imposter syndrome. So I, we can all take the advice even now. I mean, I always have this thing whenever there are panels on imposter syndrome, I'm like, I'm not going to that, you know, <laughs> because I always feel like I'm pretty confident in, in who I am. And then I reflect on it and I think, oh, but I don't think of myself as in a position to apply for this kind of um, work or to, you know, sit on um, this commission. Um, and so it really is a, just a reminder that even those of us who may feel like we're, you know, relatively confident, um, I think are always engaging in second guessing ourselves or not putting ourselves in situations that kind of push us to maybe learn new things and extend ourselves. Um, so that's what I'm taking for all of this. I don't take it as just past advice. I think it's good advice now. Okay. Um, we have a final comment here from, oh God, I'm going to butcher this name, Iguet Chick, mm -hmm. uh, saying that in her department, uh, they've been told not to go to um, office hours unless they have specific homework related questions, which um, I don't know what your department you're in, but I'm going to tell you that a, a group of you should go visit your Dean of Academic Affairs or Dean of Students and complain. <laughs> Because <laughs> you are uh, you are paying customers, and you should have the right to it. That's what you're paying for is to have access um, to professors. That's just me, <laughs> and that's going to be my final statement on that. Um, I want to thank everybody on the panel. Um, this was such a great conversation, and you know, as soon as co if COVID ever ends, I'm going to invite you all to my house for dinner. <laughs> awesome. um, and I uh, look forward to seeing you all around on campus and thank you everyone who joined us today yes thank you thank you June okay. thank you panelists um I hope I'm invited for dinner too because I love food oh, of course so. Okay, <laughs> all together, you win. Yes. Uh, so thank you to the Office of the Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement, our panelists, and June for sharing their time and experiences with our students. Obviously, it was just such a fruitful conversation. Um, I just want to remind everyone that tonight's event is part of the Graduate Initiative for Inclusion and Engagement. This is only one of a series of events throughout the semester. So to learn more about upcoming events, please be sure to check out our events calendar, which has been included in the chat. And I'd also like to extend a big thank you to everyone who attended and participated. We hope that you, will be, you were able to gain a lot out of today, today's event.